All right, so can you guys uh, see the title slide, Corset 6? Yep. Excellent. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, this is obviously our sixth webinar um, introducing a new set of core four words. So we will um, introduce those words today. But what the more that Mary Louise and I talked about um, kind of what we can use these words for, just the more we realize that today's uh, core four really helps support language development. Um, and concept development more than anything and I think both of us have really noticed how many of our students with Angelman syndrome and other significant disabilities really need much more explicit support around concept development. Um, Mary Louise is an early childhood educator so she's more expert on that than I am but we're going to just talk about um, the role of today's core four in that and we're hoping to have time to get to uh, Carolyn Musselwhite's um, her monthly storybooks and phonemic awareness uh, um, additions to the core four, which are just really fun opportunities to use the, the target vocabulary. And I'm not sure if we'll get to that or not. Carolyn couldn't join us today because she's actually on an airplane. So if we don't get to share her storybooks, then they will be shared next week because the second week of each month is our reading week. So we'll just uh, push that part of the webinar to next week if need be. Today, um, the core four is within uh, Maureen Never's uh, five steps framework that we've used to organize this whole series. We're talking about a teaching strategy of core word vocabulary instruction, and the tools that you need in order to teach this are a communication system, an AAC system with a robust uh, core word vocabulary or a pragmatically organized vocabulary such as a pod book. And for this entire series, we've really organized our core four around the research from the dynamic learning maps out of the Center for Literacy and Disability Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. What the dynamic learning maps did was they identified um, sort of the top 40 most essential words for students to be able to uh, communicate with peers, to communicate with teachers in, in classrooms about their uh, learning and their knowledge, to be able to communicate uh, with their family and in the community. And these were the top 40 words. These are heavily researched and we just couldn't find anything better. So this week or this month we are looking at the sixth core set. So if you come down here to the sixth row, you'll see that the words are what, need, are, and is, and we've had previous webinars on um, rows one through five. So this is review for any of you who have already seen one of these, but core words are just a small set of words that are used frequently all across the day in many different places, many co different contexts with many different people. So it's just those really high frequency words. These are words that are really easily combined and recombined with many other words in order to share a lot of meaning. Um, and core words is also simply a term that's very familiar to speech therapists in terms of how it describes a way to organize a communication system, um, an alternative communication system or AAC device. So when we talk about core words versus fringe, core are those very high frequency words, um, such as, if we look at our words uh, for today, such as am and are and is, whereas fringe words might be cookie or kitten or mom, right, words that um, we simply don't use as often in our everyday speech, but are often uh, highly meaningful and important. Take a moment to look within your own communication system for whoever your target student or your child is um, so that you can figure out where these words are for you. Uh, this month's words are what, need, are, and is. There's a free download within the Facebook group. Um, it's a communication display, a light tech, meaning just a paper-based communication display from a speech therapist named Deanna Wagner. What Deanna did was she took the DLM's top 40 and then added five extra words, such as the word play that she just thought was extremely important for kids. And anyone can go to the Facebook group, can download uh, this display, you'll have all of the target uh, core words that you need to follow this series and you can just start um, practicing how to access them. But you can see that I've uh, circled in red this month's core words on Deanna's display. 
The most common app that our families have reported using on an iPad for communication is Prolo-Quo-To-Go. We really encouraged people to uh, try to use a display of at least 60 symbols because in a core word system you really do need more, more symbols on the page and you can get, if you go back to some of the first webinars um, such as Does Your App Measure Up by Marie Nevers, you'll be able to um, understand our rationale for why we support this size of display. But what we've done each month is just introduced another four words. And what you're going to see is that each month as we've added more, we're kind of slowly tackling the whole display of words that are available on Proloquo or um, they tend to be similarly displayed on other core word systems such as uh, TouchChat and many others. Um, for this month, we're looking at what need are and is. Uh, what is in the top row, uh, this month's words are highlighted in purple, so you'll see what in the top row, need in the row beneath that. And then for anyone using Proloquo, I've already gotten questions about how to find this word, so that's what the big red arrow is. The word is is highlighted in purple because that's one of this month's words, but I want to draw your attention just to that little uh, triangle in the corner where my arrow is pointing at. Any word in Proloquo that has um, a pop-up menu for the other tenses of the word, for the other forms of the word, if you press that, um, then you'll see something like that. If you press is, then you'll get the word be and other forms of be. Um, and what's important here that, that many of our folks who are new to Proloquo haven't realized is that if you want the word are, you need to actually precede it with um, the word that would make sense for it. So for example, if I hit I and then I go to is and I hold it down, I can hold down any word that has that little triangle in the corner. If I hold it down, I get my pop-up menu. If I hold it down, I get the option of am, past tense, and future tense. Um, it's not going to offer me the word are because that wouldn't be grammatically correct with the word I. But if I instead select the word you and then hold down is, my pop-up bar comes up and now I get the word are. So hopefully that answers um, the question that a few of you have had trying to figure out how you were going to find the word R in Proloquo. And if there's any similar questions, just answer, ask them in the Facebook group or at the end of this webinar, and hopefully we can, we can help with that. All that said, I would say don't overthink this. Um, I probably, I think I model a paper-based version of Proloquo probably three or four times more often than I do the electronic version. And when I'm modeling the word is, am, are, be, all those different versions of the word is, every time I just indicate the word is. I'm not trying to be perfectly grammatically correct with paper, and I actually think that's one reason why these paper-based versions for us to model on are so incredibly helpful, because we don't get too caught up in trying to be absolutely perfect and grammatically correct, especially with our folks who are real newbies to a communication device. If they're really early in their language development, then that's a really common mistake for young children is to use different tenses, right? So we can speak the correct one while simply um, highlighting with our finger, indicating with our finger the correct symbol. And um, I'd love to actually hear from Maureen or Carolyn about uh, how they how they handle that, but I just model each version of the word is, each tense of it, um, by simply selecting that icon each time. So the reason that we are targeting core words and really trying to um, be very careful about how we address them, there's a few things. First, when we uh, when Mary Louise sort of brought to the Angelman community the idea of aided language input, um, most of us had never heard of such thing. Most of us had never heard of modeling a communication device while talking to our children. What we had experienced was a speech therapist coming into our home and asking our children to show us things. Show me this, show me that, touch this, touch that. Um, but we had actually never heard of someone telling us that we needed to start modeling. So we heard the instructions to start modeling, we got displays such as this, or we got pod books, and we tried to do all of it. We tried to use every word and we tried to form complete sentences, and many of us really bombed out quickly. It just didn't make sense to us, and we as parents really struggled. 
So when we're targeting core words, we're not telling you to only use four words in a month, but what we're trying to do is make it really easy for all of us as parents and as teachers to just target a doable number of words so that we can be really automatic. We can learn to memorize where those words are um, within our child's system so we can quickly and effortlessly find them when we need them and therefore we can be more effective in our modeling with our kids. At the same time, we're trying to strengthen our kids' concept knowledge of all these uh, different specific words by associating the words with all the different things they do across the day. So, for example, you know, most of our kids probably already know the difference between I and you and them and they, but maybe they don't. So we're going to model the use of them in order to strengthen kind of their knowledge of what those specific words mean. Because if our kids haven't been able to explore the use of language and how they speak it, then they haven't received any correction and support. So just as a young child um, might point to a girl and refer to it as he and have someone correct them and say, oh yes, she is over there. And that's how kids develop that concept knowledge of what he versus she is. Our kids, if they've never had access to those words, then they haven't received that same kind of instruction and example. And so we're going to use these words across the day just to develop their knowledge. And I'm spending more time on concept knowledge because we decided to kind of make that uh, the theme of today's webinar. And what we're also doing by targeting specific core words is just increasing the frequency of how often all of us and hopefully eventually our student um, uses and combines these words and recombines them in different contexts throughout the day. But what I think you'll have noticed is really a common uh, theme throughout this entire series is that we're starting with what we can do as the adults, as the parents, as the teachers, um, rather than starting with what our kids are currently doing. So we're starting with how we can become really expert and automatic using these words and building up to getting our kids to the same place. So um, our focus for set six um, are the words what, need, are, and is. And three of those words in particular are just particularly helpful for uh, concept development, which we'll get into. So concept development um, is something that will make sense to you if you're a parent, but you may have just never known that there was a label for it. Um, we know with all young children that children learn by direct experience, by watching what everyone else is doing and then trying to imitate it, by physically exploring their world um, and exploring language and the use of language. So they see people talking and they try to babble, they try to use the same words. They see parents using tools such as, you know, hammers or knives or scissors and they try to imitate that and explore that and they bang things together and they roll things out. Um, and that's how kids develop the understanding of all kinds of different concepts. So, for example, think of a toddler who sees a dog walk into the room and points at it and says, cat. What that toddler is telling us is that they've started understanding the concept of dogs and cats. Now, they haven't yet figured out how to correctly identify them or label them, but they know that when they see a creature that has four legs and a tail and a head in a certain location, that that reminds them of something like cat or a dog and they'll, they'll label it, they might identify it, they might point to it and what happens with those kids who can use words that way is the people around them say yes that is a cat, that's the kitty cat, we like the cat or that's a dog, that's not a kitty, that's our doggy, stuff like that and that's how kids develop both the vocabulary to say what something is, but also the mental representation of what that is, right? So they start to make sense of the world and understand the difference between a person based on the features of what a person is as opposed to an animal, as opposed to a plant, etc. So concept knowledge is what allows us to organize our world and notice patterns and categories and notice similarities and differences and then start applying words to all these things that we're noticing so that we can now talk about the world around us and ask questions about the world around us and keep extending our learning. Um, Mary Louise, do you want to add anything to that part before I go on because I was just going to talk now about barriers to this concept not, of really, not, not all good. 
All right. Um, we know that our kids with disabilities have real barriers to this kind of learning, to this kind of concept development. Um, and those barriers for our kids with Angelman can be profound. So for example, kids learn about the world by physically interacting with it. But if you have a child who maybe starts walking at three or five or ten, um, who maybe when they do become mobile have to put all of their cognitive resources into just being mobile because with all of their balance issues and muscle tone issues, just being mobile takes everything they've got. Just trying to walk across the room takes all their concentration. Then they're not going to be able to explore the world in the same way. Uh, we know that many of our kids with Angelman syndrome have um, significant vision issues. They might have strabismus, so their eyes aren't properly aligned and they're just not seeing the world around them. They might have very poor acuity. Um, there's just a number of vision issues that come up. And we know that children who can't see the world effectively are really going to struggle to be able to map. When people use a word um, and point to something, our kids might not be able to see it in time to even know what that word is referencing, right? And if kids don't have um, speech, then they're not going to be able to ask questions. They're not going to be able to ask clarifying questions. They're not going to be able to point at a cat and say dog and have someone realize um, that they're still working on that concept development and provide the correct label for what it is they're looking at and then extend, yes, dogs, we have a dog, that's a dog, our dog's name is, etc. Um, so just the physical nature of Angelman syndrome um, creates physical and sensory barriers to kids developing this kind of concept knowledge. Then we have all the neurological parts of Angelman syndrome because Angelman is overwhelmingly a neurological disorder. So most of the way that Angelman affects our kids learning is through the neurology. So kids might have perfectly um, normal vision, maybe they don't have strabismus, but their brain may not process what they see in a way for kids to use their vision effectively. They may not process correctly what they're hearing so that what they hear and what we hear might actually sound different essentially um, in their own brains. There may be a delay from when they see something or hear it before they can actually organize their body to turn and look at it or attend to it. Um, they may have um, oversensitivities in their hands and in the rest of their body so they're very alert to every single sound and every bit of movement in their environment which is very typical with their kids. They may have sensory oversensitivity to things like touch and so rather than touch and explore in order to learn more about the world they actually pull their hands back and protect the palms of their hands and the soles of their feet from contact with things. Um, so all of these are ways in which our kids are not exploring the world in the same way, not getting the same amount of feedback. And so all those incidental things that just happen around kids that help typical children develop might be much harder for our kids. We know that people with Angelman syndrome have sensory processing disorders such as issues with their vestibular systems and their proprioceptive systems, which are really just the internal neurology that tells you where gravity is, which way is up, which way is down, um, that lets you know, uh, lets your body just respond to gravity and respond to the environment. And so we have kids who, for example, might be very late walkers because they have all the motor skills to be able to walk, but they actually don't have the balance and that vestibular input, or maybe they're not receiving the proprioceptive input through their joints, and so they're constantly oral, and it's just very difficult for them to organize their bodies because their bodies are just craving a lot more uh, input from from gravity and from other forces around them, so that kind of thing. And then our kids have. Um, of, have cognitive disabilities which can impact memory. We know, for example, that language development is directly tied to memory development. So if you see a bird, but you don't know what a bird is, you don't have the word yet for bird, you don't have language to map to what it is you're experiencing. If you go to the zoo and you're still working on just that early language development, you're not actually going to be able to remember as much what you saw because everything sort of blurs together until you've got language to help you kind of categorize and separate all of the different things you're learning. So you can see that there are so many ways in which the nature of Angelman syndrome really impacts our kids' development of um, concept development. Mary Louise, do you want to add anything? 
No, I think you've you've hit it all. Sorry, I don't mean to be useless, but I think you hit it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if we're going to develop um, this kind of concept development in our kids, the things that we need to be doing, we need to be really fostering um, repeated hands-on exploration of the world. Our kids need access to as many concrete objects as they can that they can touch. And you'll see this. Watch our kids in the classroom, watch our kids at home. They're often looking for things to touch, to explore the physical properties of, and chances are that tells us that they're not yet at a point where they can learn as much about the world just by looking at something, just by observing. They still need that really tactile input. And that's probably making up for lost time because maybe when they were one and two and three, they had such tactile defensiveness that they couldn't touch very many things. And now they're 10 and now they really need to be be grabbing hold of things. Maybe they didn't have the mobility when they were younger to get to the places in their environment. And so now that they've got mobility, they're older and they're trying to make up for lost time. They need to, to develop concept development, you need to see all those real life things, all those concrete objects being labeled, being identified, being used the way that they're supposed to be used um, for whatever their natural purpose is, kind of in those natural opportunity environments. So for example, Nobody ever sits a one-year-old down or a two-year-old down and takes out the toolbox and says, this is a hammer. Got it? This is a hammer. Show me the hammer. And then puts the hammer back and takes out something else. That's not how we do it. Kids see people using hammers, and then they pick up anything they can find, and they start banging away with it, and they start exploring what happens when you bang on things. They, start, they learn all kinds of things about the world, um, and slowly they develop the vocabulary for things like hammer and banging and just the cause and effect of what happens um, when you whack a hammer versus a rolling pin, and they discover through that kind of exploration the difference between a rolling pin versus a hammer, the difference between a hammer and scissors, all of that kind of thing. So our kids often need um, really re those repeated, frequent hands-on exploration so that they can start um, developing that same concept development, but they also really need language being mapped to what it is they're doing. They can knock themselves out exploring the world, but if they don't have the expressive language and they're not receiving a model of receptive, they're not receptively receiving a model of language, then they're not going to be mapping words and vocabulary onto what they're doing so that they can really start categorizing the world and making sense of the world. Um, if they don't have language, then I think one of the biggest impacts we see is they can't ask questions um, and they can't sort of make mistakes and explore language and get that natural feedback from other people about what those things are or what they look like or what they feel like to really attach meaning to words. Mary Louise, do you want to add anything? Well, yeah, I think it is. It is um, that the language and the exploration are so tightly linked, and when you can't comment on things or ask questions about things or ask what's that if you're not quite sure, then the moment disappears, and then that thing might never come your way again for six months. Um, and if someone just assumes that you've learnt it or assumes that you know you were neurologically present when it was flash in front of your face, but you never actually got the the chance to say, well, hang on, what actually is that, and what happens if I turn it over, and why are we doing this, and um, it, you know, if we, if we're not modelling how to how to talk about objects um, while the children are exploring them, then those two parts of making meaning from the world just don't mesh. Um, Okay. And so concept development is a whole bunch of different things, right? So the concept of a dog versus a cat, or just the concept of dog versus book versus person, the concept of the general concept of a mom versus who my mom is, the difference between my mom versus the word mom, right? We see this in so many books written for young children is really introducing them to what these different um, concepts are so that they can start to understand what these are. We focus on descriptive words, so what things look like and what things feel like and words like, um, well, such as colors or the fact that something is pretty or that it's ugly or that it's uh, big. Um, 
that it has many parts or it has few, all of those sorts of things. Verbs. Verbs are kind of an abstract word, so you have to kind of use them while you're doing. So if we just look at some of the target words for this month, such as is and are, these are words that need to be used while you're doing something, right? They need to be used in that 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 natural context um, rather than if you try to explain the word are or is to someone and have them just memorize the word. It just doesn't make nearly as much sense. But also there's much more concrete verbs like run and walk and jump and play. Um, the concept of opposites. Go ahead, Mary. Mary. Sorry, Erin. I, I really see this um, uh, come to the fore in the community when we have um, professionals who uh, explain to the families that they're working on vocabulary and so they will do um, you know a variety of teaching techniques in, in order to get a child to you know identify more vocabulary or match more vocabulary and this idea that we're working on vocabulary but for so many children it, if you're not modeling that word, during an activity that's rich and meaningful and engaging and that word is used in a natural context over and over again, then the, it's not, you're not actually working on vocabulary. You can, you can teach a child to you know, activate and touch the and follow an instruction and, and it seems like they're adding vocabulary but for so many of the children that we've seen over the years, it, it really has to be um, modelled and used in a rich, engaging, interactive opportunity. Um, so just for families who, um, a lot of families who comment that, you know, we need to work on vocabulary, well actually by, by using the AAC in play, in exploration, throughout the school day, that is working on vocabulary for, for the vast majority of our really early AAC users. Um, and that's something that I just see time and time again is families being stressed um, and professionals often feeling stressed that they need to work on vocabulary when often the children actually don't yet have much language. Right. And what I then see is we then come up with either developmentally inappropriate goals or we're just not working with where the child is at. And so um, I'll see kids in classrooms where we're asking them to point to this or show me which one is bigger, show me which one is smaller, but they've actually, they're still working on that concept and if we're just using words out of context then we're teaching kids theoretical meanings. Um, but not actually using them in any kind of real life way. Um, and so I think that's really what we're trying to hit home with all of this. So whether we're working on opposites, such as big versus small, smooth versus rough, you need to experience things that are small versus things that are big. Um, and we need to use those words a lot to understand that there's big and then there's really big, things like that. Um, so often, when I'm when I'm thinking of a developmentally inappropriate goal, it might be things like time um, concepts around time, about um, what comes first and last. There's often this huge assumption that kids understand all these concepts around time that they still might need a lot of experience with, or that they can just start identifying their feelings um, and just start labeling their feelings. Um, that they should be able to identify them because they should have that concept of what's happy versus sad versus lonely versus frustrated. And we, what I'll see classrooms do or teachers do is kind of um, narrow the range as though that's going to make it conceptually similar, as though, okay, we're just going to offer happy and sad and we'll work on that and as soon as you've mastered happy and sad, maybe then we'll later, uh, I don't know, somehow introduce frustrated into the mix, that kind of thing. Or we're going to work on dog and cat, but we're not going to add in you know, giraffe or anything else. We're going to get kids to identify a dog and cat. Well, I know kids who can show you dog on their communication device, but then they don't know that the dog that came into the room is a dog. Or they don't use the word dog um, to actually label what they see in their environment. So they might be learning things theoretically, but they're not actually really mastering the concept development and the language that goes with it. Um, so what we know is that modeling vocabulary, modeling core vocabulary, modeling language that is accessible to the student even if the student doesn't currently use it, it supports concept development. And you'll see that as we talk about um, the specific words that we're targeting this month. So the first word, uh, 
for this month is what? It's a very high frequency word and if you look at young children early in their language development, this is a very common word for kids to start using. It's highly interactive because as soon as you can start asking what is that, um, then you start to get all kinds of information. You start to get um, all kinds of nouns being labeled around you and information starts getting shared with you. Um, where it's probably used the most often with our kids, um, maybe not being model, but when the word what is being used the most often, it's often to get our kids to make a choice um, between different things. So which would you like? What one would you like? Um, and it also the word what just has huge value for simply being snarky, especially for our older kids, our teenagers, our tweens, our adults, as we're trying to interest them in the word what, there's what is the deal dude or what, you know, that's what. There's lots of ways that we can use the word what and just have a lot of fun with it. So we can reflect what kids are saying. So many of our students with Angelman are very, um, almost hyper alert to stimulation in their environment. So they hear a sound in the hallway and their head pops up and all their attention now has gone away from you and towards their hallway. And so we can model that back, we can reflect what they're saying, but now redirect them. So what is that sound? That's the janitor. We know the janitor. That's familiar to us. Now let's get back to what we're doing. Let's get back to reading. Or what's that at the window um, when we see them look up to see something? Maybe oftentimes movement has attracted their attention and now we've, we feel like we've lost them. This is our chance to reflect and redirect. So what is that? Oh, it's a bird. We can talk about a bird. Now we can get back to work. Um, we can help redirect our kids' attention to whatever the purpose is that we are listening for or reading for. So what are we listening to this book for? Well, we're listening so that we can identify this or compare this or so we can talk about, you know, we're, we're sitting in circle today and we're talking about animals and we're listening to all the kids talking about animals so that we can share what our favorite animal is. So words like what can really help us when we're trying to kind of harness and direct our kids' attention um, by really starting to teach them, I think as Mary Louise would say um, those filters, um, really reinforcing how to start putting up some filters, be able to identify a sound, identify something you've seen, um, and now actually move past it to get back to whatever you were doing. Mary Louise, do you want to add to this? Um, no, I think I think we've covered it before, but just for anyone who hasn't um, heard us talk about the filters before, you know, often. Um, the children, students with Angelman will be described as highly distractible, um, easily distracted, short attention span, and what we're um, really trying to support uh, professionals to um, understand is that the the be one of the biggest issues is that the children don't have filters, so everything is competing for attention at the same level. So we need to use language um, to support the children to build filters. So as Erin was saying, you know, if, if they hear the lawnmower outside, boom, their attention's out there. So we can model what is that? Oh, that's the lawnmower. We don't need to worry about that. What we do need to think about is we're listening to the story. Don't need to hear about worry about the lawnmower. The lawnmower's out there. We're listening to hear. You're doing a great job. What are we doing? We're listening to the teacher. So we're teaching them what is important to listen to and what is not, but we have to acknowledge what they have spun around and looked at or listened to to support them to acknowledge that and, and make a decision for themselves. Is that something I need to uh, listen to or attend to or not. So supporting them to use their filters and modelling through the language. Um, oh, what's that? Mm, no, don't need to worry about that. I'm here. Wow, look, we're listening to the teacher. Fantastic. Um. Perfect. So we need to model that response. So what is that? Can we navigate through the child system? Um, if we can pull that off, it's hard to do that every time. Um, but as often as we can, navigating through their system to be able to identify it or label it if that's what we think um, that they're doing. So the child who hears the lawnmower outside, what is that? It's a 
that's really our opportunity to navigate to where we would go to their categories to be able to label it. Um, it might be that that isn't enough. It might be that what they want to do is now have an interaction around it. So lots of our kids love lawnmowers. Um, so they might want to have an interaction around how much they like lawnmowers. They might actually be thinking about a story um, about a lawnmower that happened over the weekend, that kind of thing. And so that's the sort of... Um, that's the, the position that we're in as adults, is figuring out, um, can we just show them how to label it? Can we model how we would label and identify it? Is that satisfactory, or do we need to try to go a step further and, and try to comment something about it and now bring their attention back? Because there's times and places when we can follow that rabbit trail and see what it is that's so significant about that lawnmower, that bird, or that person. Um, some of our kids, for example, every time a new adult shows up at the doorway, um, they have to they alert to that person and they want to greet that person or they want to comment about that person and it's just very, very difficult for them to let go of that um, and now move on with whatever the work was before. So sometimes we have to kind of honor that, yes, that's Mrs. Johnson and you really like Mrs. Johnson and have some kind of quick interaction about Mrs. Johnson before before we move on. But whenever possible, we want to both model the what, the what is that, as well as the well, what it is, right? So, um, so what does that feel like as we're touching sandpaper? Oh, I think it's, and you're describing words, rough. And find that word and, and actually show them how they would navigate through their system to find the word that they might be thinking of. Because often when we use, when we model the word what, it's what is a high frequency core word, but often what's following what is a very specific um, noun or describing word that's not going to be right there on the front page of their communication device. And so whenever we model the word what, it's actually a great opportunity to now model the navigation through their system. Mary Louise, do you want to add anything? No, all oh, good. All right. Remembering that whatever we're doing with the communication device, I know we've said this a lot throughout this whole series, but it's about conversation. It's not about interrogation. Um, so many of our students with Angelman do not respond to, what is this? Show me what it is. It's on this page. Show me. Touch the, where it just becomes an interrogation. So when we're modeling, for example, what is a question, we're just remembering that whole conversation piece. We're going to use the expectant pause. Oh, what does this feel like? And we're going to wait. And now we might model to our, we might navigate to our describing words. Oh, maybe it feels. And start modeling. But it's that expectant pause, that invitation for our student to respond rather than kind of a direct order to give us the correct answer. We're going to accept all their multi-model responses. So for example, we might say, um, you know, what is that? And the child might sign bird or somehow indicate to us that they're seeing a bird. We're going to accept that. But we are, what we really want to also try to do is, oh, yes, you're saying bird, and then navigate to how they would actually find that word using their communication system. Because most of these kinds of words, most of the words that we might be digging, most of those words that would follow the word what are something that's going to take some navigation to find it in the system, but also something that other people might not understand what it is that child's thinking of. So we know when they do this or that, that their, that their answer to the word what is cookie or bird or whatever it is that's specific to it. But many other people won't. And so we're going to reflect that response back to them. Yes, it is this, navigating through their system so that they'll be able to have more clarity when they communicate with others. When we're trying to, when we're using the word what around sort of harnessing their attention, we, maybe we ask our student, well, what book should we read? And our kids see someone at the doorway and now they're already distracted by that. Um, here again is just what Mary Louise and I have been saying. So what do you see? Oh, you see Prin Principal Johnson. I see her too. We can model the word C. Uh, we can model uh, for her and I. Those are all great high frequency words. Now, what were we doing? We were reading what books should we read and getting right back on track whenever possible. 
The second word for this month, and we're not going to give this word a lot of attention um, just because we spent so much time around um, concept development and, and language development together, is the word need. And I think to me the biggest significance of the word need is that it's an opportunity for us to teach that all of us need assistance. If you go back to um, it was our first or our second um, set of core words when we talked about the word help. We, we spent a lot of time making sure that we're not always asking our kids to ask for help, but that we're instead also showing them how they can help us. We're showing them how much help we need from the people around us. So with words like need and with help, if we really unpack those words, we can see that as a society, we don't really value them. We don't really value people who are needy. We don't really value neediness, the concept of neediness. We don't really value um, even needing things. We like to live in a fictional world where everyone's really self-sufficient. And so when we model words like need, that is a very high frequency word, but we just need to be really aware of how we're using it with our kids to make sure that we are showing that this is a world where all of us need something, um, all of us need help, um, that sort of thing. And we can use the word need with things like, hmm, what else do we need to finish this? Oh, I think we need a rolling pin because we're rolling out dough with Play-Doh, or I think we need, oh, let's read, we, what do we need? We need a book. Um, so we can use need in a lot of uh, really fun classroom activities as well, but just be, be conscious um, of the, some of the negative connotations that our society attaches to the word need, and go out of your way to show how much you need other people and how much, how confident you are asking for help and receiving help from other people because I think that um, we just need to make sure that we're teaching our kids that what we most value about their use of the word need and use of words like help is that they can direct the help they get to meet their needs, that they can identify what they need and they can get their needs met, that it's not something that's just always going to be imposed on them. Hey, Louise, do you want to add anything? No, yeah. all good. All right. Um, so our third and fourth words are are and is. These are very high frequency. Um, these are words that really support description, right? So here we can uh, we can be labeling things and we can be uh, describing things. So when you think about how many sentences we use that use words like are and is, um, those might be some of the, the most common things we're doing with that word. So that is big, or I think you are happy today, or you are not happy about that. Um, so these are, these are words that allow us to identify and describe the world around us, which is just what makes these words so helpful when we're really prioritizing things like concept development. So some of those things might be, some of the concept development we might be working on is things like concepts of time. Uh, we talk a lot about, and many of our teachers are amazing at providing visual schedules for our kids um, so that our kids know what is coming next and what are we going to do so that we can just build a lot more uh, predictability into their days. A lot of kids know what's coming next. And I remember the first time that Maggie's school team really wanted to work on things like visual schedules. Um, I was just like, she already knows. She observed so much of, of what is happening in the classroom. Why are we spending all this time on visual schedules? She knows. She can predict. As soon as the teacher says this and everybody starts standing up and putting this away, she knows just from the context what's coming next. Well, as we're thinking about visual schedules, what we might really want to be doing is focusing on using the child system to talk about what is coming next and what we are going to do. So yes, provide the visual schedule um, so that the day can be very predictable for our kids and that can really support them, but also use their language because it's the modeling of the words are and is that provides that foundation for them to one day be able to ask what is coming next or what are we going to do. Whereas if it's just a visual schedule, um, m many times that link to being able to now ask questions about it or say I don't want to do that, I actually want to do something else, um, just doesn't happen, that emphasis just doesn't happen. Mary Louise, do you want to add anything? 
No, no. Um, uh, in terms of R and is, I, I suppose the biggest thing that uh, families of um, uh, young children who are using pod or children, older children who are using early language pod is they're not going to find R and is in it. So the biggest thing that um, for pod families in terms of R and is is that you know rule number one of pod is uh, be Zen and go with the book. And at the early language levels, those um, little words aren't in there. You know, the the pods are designed around the key words. So it's not that um, uh, they're, they're certainly there in the um, in the two per page opening books later on. But if you're struggling to find um, R and is in your book, then it's not there for a reason. And that's because of the, um, those books are at an earlier language level. So you'd be modeling um, the other keywords in the sentence like Erin was talking about, you know, um, what or need or um, uh, you, are you, um, are you helping, you help, I need help, uh, are you going, you know, we go, I'm asking a question, are we go, we go. Um, so I think that's going to be um, probably one thing coming out of uh, this month's four core is that for some families you're simply shifting your focus to still using those keywords of the phrases but understanding that it is okay that in your level of book those little words aren't there. And I think that that applies just as much to anyone using a core word system. So if, if where your child is at conceptually is, is at language wise is not yet at R and is then stick with the keywords exactly the same way. Um, you know R and is are very high frequency you'll have lots of time to get to them but the other words in the sentence that will have just more concrete meaning um, might be a very good starting place for those kids too. Um, as we're using our words like what, what is, and what, um, and are, um, thinking about predictability in books. So Carolyn will be doing a webinar next week on reading, the repeated readings of familiar books, but also repeating experiences across books. So if we sort of make it a habit of asking, oh, what is my favorite part? What is your favorite part? What do I like about this book? What book do I like? If we make it a habit, to have that same conversation with lots of different books, then we're creating more predictability around it that way, and it's just a natural opportunity to use these, to use these words. Um, and we can use these words just for lots of learning strategies, and we're going to get much more into depth uh, with this in two weeks on uh, February 18th in that webinar where we talk about uh, taking this um, this core word vocabulary development and really applying it to the curriculum. So um, when we're using words like what and are is uh, or and is to label or to share, to compare and contrast, to describe, that sort of thing. But that's really um, much of the value of these words in the classroom. We're going to remember to model and then wait because we're giving our kids as much time as they need to process what it is we're asking of them and then to produce a response. And we're just trying to create as many invitations as possible for them to take an opportunity to communicate back with us rather than us insisting on a specific response. Um, and this is the last thing I want to say with this is don't forget that not is a word we introduced uh, some time ago in this series because it's even more um, high frequency but when we're thinking about these words with concept development what something is and what it is not knowing what something is not really helps us develop the concept of what it is and so with the word not we can say so much about whether something is big or it is not big we don't have to have every word and its opposite um, so long as we have the word not to do our negating. So um, Mary Louise why don't I now change the screen over to you Hold on, so that you can follow up on what you were just saying about uh, oh, okay. do this in pod. Yeah, can you see my slide? Not yet. Okay. Have you accepted it? Uh, hang on, sorry. Uh, yeah, show my screen. Sorry, I forgot I had to do that bit. 
Okay. Okay. Can you see me? Oh. Yes. Can you see that? Can you see that webinar thing as well? You are up. Uh, can you see the webinar control panel on my screen? Nope. All we can see is your slides. Okay, that's all right. I can see the control panel. I just didn't know that yet. Sorry, everyone. It's half past one in the morning and the brain's a bit slow. Okay. Um, so I just want to follow up quickly about um, the what is and are issues. So we've got um, here, um, if you're using a one per page opening book, if we're concentrating on the word what, um, then we're going to say more to say. I'm asking a question and there on a 16 per page is my what. I've also got what's happening um, and then if I'm going on a, so it's a 40 per page, a two page opening book, so I've got my um, question marker, I'm asking a question, tells me to go to 1B and there's my line of questions, um, question words and there's what in there. So then I can say what you, what me, what do, what want, what I want, what you want, that kind of thing. I've had my question marker and there's my word I can model. So again in the two page opening books, um, uh, the line of questions will always be in the same place so you'll have that on each page. So you will always have what in that same place that you can model in any um, category and section of the book. Uh, when we're looking at the pod 15 that a lot of our um, students with Angelman are using, we're going to be modeling, I'm asking a question, what? Now, when we're because we're Zen and we're following the, um, the language that's here at this level, we've got the word what, we've got what's that, because um, that's a very early question that um, early language learners ask, well, what's that? What's that? And we've also got what's next, which is a very important one for many of our students. Uh, and what do you think? Asking a comment. So we can combine those words, um, but we can also use the pre-stored phrase um, question that's there. If we're looking at the 15 plus and we have a lot of um, children who are starting to shift to the 15 plus. Uh, again, we're going, I'm asking a question and you've got what here. If you see on the left hand side, you've, you've also got a folder for question actions and in question actions, um, you've got a button down the bottom so you can say um, on this page, you can say what you want, what you have, what you do, what you see, what I see, what I like. Um, and then in my bottom corner, I've got my am, is, are, will, can. So uh, here is when I would add in what are, what is. So that's how I would navigate to those um, words in the different sections of a pod 15 plus. And sorry, I've written up here that it's a pod 15, but this is the pod 15 plus template. So again, you've got your what are and that pops up into there. We have a number of um, older children, adults using the pod 60 keyword. Um, and again, you can find, you'll find what under question. You've got am, is, are, were here in a little pop up. If you're following it from what, you would go into your question page first and you can see that um, your what question is up there and then uh, for the first two columns, you've got all your what questions um, that people might like to use as a whole phrase. What did you say? What does this mean? What do you think? What's your name? What time is it? You've got a, a cell there, which I'll explain in a moment, which um, is highlighted in pink, what am, is, are, was, were. You've got what's happening, what am I supposed to do, uh, what's next, and what did you do. So if we go to that what am, is, are, if I press that button, then what, you can see up in the message window, at the top, what has gone up there and now I am back on page one and the am, is, are, were pop up has come up. So now I can touch what am, what is, what was, what are and that's how I would access uh, what is, what are, what was, etc. Um, and that's probably about it for the questions. For most of, um, sorry I'll go back up the top. Um, 
for most of our students um, and young people you going are going to be on the pod 15 so I think over the next week if, if we want to discuss um, in the in the group you know about asking what question what questions are a really fantastic early language question that we can ask across the day um, we need to mark it with you know I'm asking a question what um, one thing that's come up in the last couple of weeks especially is um, uh, when we raised earlier uh, parents and professionals wanting to work on vocabulary is um, you know pod books and pod app um, don't have a search function so um, what families um, and some professionals have been asking if they can do is put um, vocabulary tabs to remind themselves where the words are on the side of the book so some people put like little post-it notes or little tabs on the um, on the side of the book with the word what and you know that will be on on page eight questions and that will remind them where what is and what we've learned over time you know, over the last 10 20 years of using um, pod is that that actually doesn't help us and it certainly doesn't help the children it doesn't help the children because it doesn't show the children how we're going to get to that pathway the brain works in patterns and the idea of pod is that you set your pragmatic intent first so we need to get to the word what through saying I'm asking a question um, and it actually doesn't teach us if we just use those shortcuts of well I'm asking a question and it's what and I'm going to look on my side tab where I stuck a post-it note last week to remind myself it was there and I'm going to flick to there we're not actually teaching the child the pathway to get to there uh, so again you know uh, Janelle Sampson's big um, rule um, is you just go zen, zen with the pod and you go through the pathways and if you you know, if you do um, use the pathways in any system properly, if you do go through categories and you do use it in meaningful um, patterns throughout the day, your brain will learn it and it will become more natural. So initially it might feel more stressful and it might feel easier to stick a post-it note on the side of page 8a that the word what is there, but actually what we need to do is across the course of the day just practice, oh I'm asking a question, what, what is that? I'm asking a question, what are you doing? I'm asking a question, what on earth is going on? Um, and that helps us develop our fluency one little section at a time and it also we're consistently modelling how the child could say that if and when they want to say that. Uh, I'm all good Erin. All right, uh, can you transfer it back over to me? Uh, yes, oh goodness how do I do that? Stop. Uh, hang on. Oh I'm sorry, did it go? Change presenter, Erin. Okay. Sorry, everybody. That's all right. Okay. All right. That so that really wraps up um, this webinar. I wanted to bring your attention to some upcoming webinars. Uh, next week, on February 11th, Carolyn Musselwhite will be talking about um, independent book exploration and reading. And so she had uh, developed some stories for using this month's core four, so she'll have that next week as well as quite a bit of other stuff about how to really support our kids um, to, to enjoy uh, independent book exploration and better access reading. On February 18th, we'll be talking about connecting core vocabulary with the curriculum, and part of that will be um, just more on concept development and descriptive vocabulary, so that we can so it can just be simpler and easier, and just have some more clarity about what it is we're trying to do with specific targeted vocabulary to help our kids um, access whatever the curriculum is, whether it's the general curriculum in the regular classroom in an inclusive context or whether it's in a separate classroom, whatever is going on, um, we can better make those connections between the topic of what's being studied and the core vocabulary. So uh, that will be with me on February 18th. And then you get to hear from Carolyn again on February 25th when she talks about social scripts, which is really just about um, 
creating systems, scaffolds, for our kids to become more effective storytellers, to have kind of in deeper interactions with other people by us pre-planning ahead of time, uh, whenever possible, co-planning with our kids what it is they might want to be talking about and then building those supports so that they can do it. So those are the webinars that are coming up this month. Some of your possible next steps, um, I would encourage you to identify some concepts that you think are really worth prioritizing um, for your student to emphasize across the day. Um, so maybe it's descriptive words, being able to describe things. Um, if it's still, if it's more at the identifying stage, then it's really also thinking about how things can be categorized. Whatever those concepts are, start thinking about that. And if you want to follow that through further, then join us, like I said, on February 18th. Um, select some books just to read for fun and think about how to use words like what while we're reading. We talked about, you know, what's your favorite part? Um, this, is, this is my favorite part. Um, what is funny? That sort of thing as we're reading the book. Um, if you can't engage a student with books, then one of the best rules of thumb is to make sure that there is something gross, disgusting, slimy, etc. somewhere in the book um, because that just tends to be a great hook for almost all of them. And uh, whether you are studying cell biology or uh, frog life cycles, there is something disgusting, slimy, or gross that we can find in just about everything. So then share your experiences in the Facebook group. We love to hear from you um, and hear what's working, what made sense, and what didn't. And now, while if anybody has questions, while you think about that or raise your hand or type in your question, I'll just remind you that the ASF communication training series is made available by the Angelman Syndrome Foundation uh, through a generous grant from the Foster Family Charitable Foundation in California. Um, we can take questions. All right, we do have one question so far. Um, I'm using the accordion paper form as AAC where it displays the alphabet and some core words. Can I use the icon want for need? Yes. And I would say just any time you run up against an issue where you can't find the exact word you want, then by all means substitute a higher frequency word. So want is even higher frequency than need. Um, and if that, that might actually be even more appropriate for where your student's at with their language development. So I would say absolutely. And over time, you'll move to a system with more words and then you can start kind of introducing the nuance between want and need. Because obviously everything our kids want is not necessarily everything they need. <laughs> um, that's the only question that we have so far. Let's see. Yeah, I don't see any more. Um, I would like to remind everyone to please take the survey when you're done. When we're done with the webinar, you'll be prompted to take a survey and. Um, we've gotten some great feedback and questions and ideas for future webinars, so please fill those out. Um, so just a rem little reminder about that. And let me see if I had any more. Yeah, I do have one more that came in. Yay, I thought I was hoping if I talked a little bit, someone would ask another question. Um, my son has autism and does not have Angelman. He primarily uses AAC for needs and wants. He, uh, we have tried to increase modeling. He has started recently to just parrot back the device, what we have entered on the modeling iPad. You know, I think that that's, I, I would say that that's okay. I've seen a lot of small children who do that too. Um, and with my so-called typical kid, there was a phase that she went through where she did a lot of sort of imitating back. Um, if we think about, I'm trying to remember which webinar this was, but this was, I think, uh, mid-October. We did a webinar about um, understanding how there's a stage where kids are observing and then a stage where they start really exploring and imitating, and that comes before being able to um, kind of perform and more independently start really participating. So I think if a child was at a stage where they're parroting back or imitating. Just I would in my head think of that as imitation. 
and now try to build on that one step further. So if you modeled something and now he parrots it back, try to add it, add one more word to it, try to add one more idea to it, extend it one past where he took it, and I think that that will still be valuable. If all he's doing is practicing the motor pathway, to express the message that you just did by him parroting it back, then that's incredibly valuable because we know that kids on the spectrum have a lot of dyspraxia and if that's all he ends up doing is practicing that through his imitation, then I think that's really valuable too. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't think of that as being too negative. I would just try to extend it a step further. Mary Louise, do you want to add anything? Um. Yes, if it's all right with you, I might. Um, I've written the question down, and I might uh, comment in the group. Um, I, my brain's just a bit tired. That's all. Sorry, and I don't want to. Um, <laughs> I can't find the words that um, I know my brain is trying to tell me. Is it one a.m. or two a.m. your time? Uh, two two a.m. <laughs> All right, I think we can forgive that. All right, so if that person can go to the Facebook group uh, to see what Mary Louise would add. She just has so much insight around um, both the language development and the role of the dyspraxia that I, I, I'm really interested to see what she says. Yeah, and I'd love to hear what Maureen has to say too. So, mm -hmm. um, and uh, one thing, if um, that, um, I nearly said contestant. See, this is the problem. Um, <laughs> that caller could just clarify: is the child um, pressing the message window to activate the whole sentence, mm -hmm. um, or are they saying, repeating um, the phrase word, like going and is touching each individual individual word? Mm. Um, because that's kind of two different things. If 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 you say I like this and it's in the message window and you've activated the message window to say the whole sentence of I like this and the child touches the message window again, that's that's one thing that we can talk about. But if it's that you've said I like this and then you've activated the message window and it's disappeared and he's then gone I like this, um, then that's kind of a separate thing if that makes sense. So if, if you can just clarify that, I'd love, I'd love to talk about this in the group. Um, in the ASF group if you're happy to, but if, if you could just clarify that, then um, we can kind of target our response a bit better. 